Hello there, traveler. You've wandered deep into the underground this evening. Do you brave many such dungeons? If so, I may have something that could interest you, but be warned. There are more than rats lurking in these shadows. So the Nokia N-Gage handheld gaming console may be one of the most spectacular failures in gaming history. The awkward gaming phone fell apart over a cascade of mistakes, all forming a turducken of impossibility so absurd that it has less total physical releases than the Wii U. Now, there's plenty of retrospectives on the train wreck of the business side of things, but much less has been said about the actual games. It's a miracle that the EKAL21 team made this platform playable again. This is genuine historical preservation, and I'm grateful to see it. As of this recording, there's no multiplayer functionality or anything fancy, but let's be realistic here. The idea that someone went through the effort to make N-Gage games playable at all is incredible. What's wilder is that some of them are actually worth playing. The result is a surreal glimpse at a handheld that wasn't quite as weak as a Nintendo DS, but also nowhere near the capabilities of a PSP, which would release one year later. This becomes incredibly evident with its marquee launch title, the game you tuned in to hear about, The Elder Scrolls Travels Shadow Key by Virtuel and TKO. Sadly, neither studio exists anymore, but both had impressive runs on the Java scene. Just as impressive is the bewilderingly long list of Elder Scrolls Travels games. To be fair, the vast majority of them are just turn-based grid dungeon crawlers, as well as a really terrible demake of Oblivion that somehow came out after Shadow Key. So the only entries really worth talking about are this one, and a cancelled Oblivion PSP game, but that's a quest for another day. As for Shadow Key, it is fascinating. Not great, not terrible, but utterly fascinating. It's like a Frankenstein's monster of Elder Scrolls games crammed inside a few megabytes of data. The character creation and player animations look like they're out of arena. The world, meanwhile, is Daggerfall made linear, and the combat is that utter dice roll based nonsense from Morrowind that Oblivion rightfully threw out the darn window. This last part, to be clear, isn't a deal breaker, but it does come with some important caveats you have to bear in mind when going into Shadow Key. It's not hit detection that's the problem, it's the dice rolls. Because the dice are constantly rolling against you. You will die. A lot. Your body will be ground to dust in the early hours, even when playing as a barbarian. Speaking of which, here's my character, Bob. She's a high elf who prefers to smash things. I say prefers because before long, I had to start specking her character sheet for ranged combat. Why did I go from long swords and maces to ranged attacks? Well, because you're objectively better off with throwing daggers and a bow than you ever will even with the most menacing mace or sword. Despite frequent level ups, every rat, spider, bandit, etc. can and will decimate you if you try to take them head on more than one at a time up close. And sometimes even that is too much. Remember how Skyrim gives you way too many potions to know what to do with? Not a problem here! You will be begging for health potions until you finally get a ranged weapon. You may be thinking about using spells, but you see, magic has a weird hit detection of its own that turns things like tables into impenetrable shields for whomever is standing on the other side. Bows don't have this problem. Bows and throwing daggers also use less stamina, have unlimited ammo, and benefit from a generous auto-aim. They typically take longer to kill things, but passive-aggressively shooting the enemies to death is the easiest way to survive in this game. I know it may sound like I didn't enjoy playing Shadow Key, but I did. The level design is legitimately jaw-dropping for a device so small. This is a Bioshock 3D tier D-make. It's a fully realized CRPG with branching choices, optional quests, and most surprisingly of all, actually fun writing. The plot centers on an ancient shadow demon, Pergen Asul. You see, shadows aren't just a convenient way to obscure the draw distance. You'll literally be attacked by shadows sometimes and need one of the titular shadow keys to pierce the veil to proceed. It's even suggested that shadows in the world of Elder Scrolls are in fact voids of potential energy containing all that has, could have, and will happen in that space across all time, creating essentially pocket dimensions. It's a very weird high concept idea, but you know what? I dig it. What's weirder is Asul 
whole plans to free himself by manipulating you into helping him by tearing through the veils and kicking his bum to counterintuitively free him. Because apparently he went to the same school of villainy as Emperor Palpatine in the Disneyverse. Okay then, you do you, Asul. Along the way, you get caught up in a conflict between factions over the fate of Skyrim. There's this Red Guard who clearly has more going on than she's willing to admit, and in a rare turn, there are friendly goblins that will talk to you. In fact, several quests aren't your typical fare. You go from helping town merchants by clearing out bandits to weird stuff like helping a goblin track down a rare artifact so he helps you on a separate quest, or resurrecting a zombie into his old human self. I doubt anyone going into this was expecting a well-written fantasy RPG. While this isn't Planescape or anything, there are some great moments. Efforts were made to deliver something more than just a boilerplate adventure, even if it does rely on some well-worn tropes. Tropes. The developers even use text blocks at times to fill in the gaps where the engine clearly isn't capable enough, which should feel cheap, but instead adds to that classic CRPG atmosphere. Plus, unlike a lot of modern RPGs, Shadow Key is very happy to just leave you dangling if you aren't paying attention. I'm not saying when you'll actually want to take down notes of directions and clues characters give you, because they will not repeat themselves. Shadow Key is a hardcore RPG, and it owns it well. Combined with the charming if stiff aesthetic of the game world, it's easy to get lost in exploring the many elaborate dungeons and large, for the time, open world environments. It's still fairly linear, but you can work around that. The draw distance is also about as bad as those old Bethesda Terminator games, but I'm willing to let that go seeing as, even if you can't see beyond a few yards, your arrows still hit enemies past the draw distance. which is. Very much appreciated. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, this game has item and NPC persistence. Even when you transition between environments. Persistent tracking of items and NPCs in separate areas on a phone in the early 2000s. That is frigging insane! and speaks to how much effort they put into this thing. Before too long, you stop caring if you gotta will down dozens of slow monsters with a bow and arrow. It's worth it just to find out what new dungeon layout, technical feat, or story development is waiting around the corner. Achieving something this complex is remarkable in its own right. Shadow Key deftly rides this incredibly narrow line between old school tedious and old school fun, which is honestly pretty on brand for early Elder Scrolls games. It's nowhere near Battlespire levels of difficult, but it's sure as hell harder than what modern Elder Scrolls fans are used to. This absence of handholding is going to be a huge selling point for some, and what will turn others away from even trying it. If you are curious though, the main things to remember are, number one, again, ranged combat is your friend. If you're insistent on fighting with melee only, expect to spend a lot of time kiting around enemies, which is not the easiest thing to do with the controls, or standing still while waiting for your HP to regenerate between fights, or go poor from buying health potions. Number two, you will be substantially more capable after a few levels and well-placed stat points into speed, endurance, and agility. Mages will also obviously need to invest in other stats associated with magic, but these three helped me the most as a barbarian. Number three, magic Magic of potions are everywhere in later levels, so if you're having a rough start as a mage, hang in there till around snow line. Things should get smoother then. 4. The map key by default is the number 9. I customized all of my inputs to this layout for maximum comfort, but I miss that there was a map function bound to this key. Use it! Learn from my mistake! While several dungeons have memorable layouts, they reuse textures for the basic rooms a lot. This is as disorienting as it sounds. When in doubt, use the map. Number 5. You can quick equip a set of around 7 or so weapons, spells, and items that you can cycle through fairly easily. I don't recommend equipping everything, but instead keeping your MVP items equipped at all times. In a pinch, you can still freeze time by accessing your inventory, but traditionally, keep two weapons equipped and several restorative items to refill your stamina and health. This is so intuitive and will save you so much time. Another mark in the game's favor. If that all sounds good, you're in for a solid 12 or so hour adventure through a lost part of Elder Scrolls history. It should be noted that neither iteration of the Engage hardware was quite up to the task of running this game physically though, even with the already intense concessions made. However, it emulates great and shows what truly could have been. 
I mean, if Red Guard and Battlespire are playable today, why not re-release this? It's the first game to ever actually let you run around Skyrim. It could have been like the Doom 64 to Skyrim Anniversary's Doom Eternal. Maybe repackaging mods as your own content is easier, but this would have been a far cooler bonus if you ask me. Now, you might be thinking this is the only notable AAA franchise to come to Engage. I mean, who would release, you know, a full-fledged AAA title on a phone besides this after a rough launch window? Well, you'd be wrong. This was the first of several high-profile releases to the system, and its digital successor, Engage 2.0, Tomb Raider, Metal Gear Solid, Resident Evil, and more. So keep your eyes peeled. You'll be sure to see more of them down here in the underground very soon. Until next time, traveler.